So welcome to session four. We're gonna start with data, uh, which are divided into variables and lists in this language. Um, we probably won't do them full justice because I'm anxious to get you to uh, what Scratch, uh, what's the extensions to Scratch call my blocks, um, which professional programmers would call subroutines or procedures. Um, that's a very powerful concept that will be important to the kids uh, later in the season. Variables will be important too. Lists, not necessarily, but we'll have some fun with them tonight. And then time permitting, we'll talk about sound and um, display or display and sound. The, um, those are entertaining, but they can also be useful for debugging. If we don't get to them, please uh, browse through the PDF that I send you tomorrow to see what's there because when the kids have trouble figuring out what the heck their program is doing, where it's gone astray, adding sounds or displays can really help them sort that out. Uh, so we'll see if we get there tonight. So variables are first, uh, and there's we'll show live uh, in a, a little while. Uh, there's a menu called variables, and the first thing on the menu is make a variable, and the second thing is make a list. And so that's kind of shown here on this slide. Um, if you say make a variable, let's say you decided you wanted a variable called distance, it creates two new blocks for you. One that allows you to set that new variable to a particular value, that's the most common use. Um, and you can drag that into your program to set the variable to zero or one or 100, whatever's uh, relevant to its use. Um, and I'll say more about what it is a variable in a second. Um, it's also common to want to add a number to a variable. You don't need a separate block to do that, but they provide that for convenience. The general way of doing that is to use the set function and then put a formula in the oval part on the right in place of that zero that you see on the screen. And uh, we'll touch a little bit on formulas tonight, but there's a uh, pretty sophisticated uh, math and logic formulas that we, we touched on, I think it was last night a little bit as well. It, it's, it's there when the kids need it to add, subtract, multiply, divide, or compare, et cetera. And then the fourth thing that it uh, adds is, um, well, the, the, actually the first thing is the oval at the top is how you refer to the current value of the variable. So what is a variable? It's two things. It's in the ballpark of what algebra calls a variable. Uh, uh, something that can have a variety of values. Um, but in a computer, it's really not an abstract thing like it's in algebra. It's a storage location. And depending on the computer language, uh, variables may have types. So uh, you, you may say this is an integer, always an integer, always will be an integer, and this is a text variable, and this is a Boolean uh, true-false variable, and uh, there can be lots of other types of variables in what are called strongly typed languages. But you don't need to know that for Scratch because it's not a strongly typed language, it's weakly typed. You can put just about anything in a variable and, and Scratch will attempt to deal with it. Um, that can get you in trouble, but it is also very flexible. Um, so we'll err on the side of flexibility in Scratch. Uh, and you'll see a little bit more uh, what, what I'm jabbering about when we get into the examples. Um, so how would we write an EV3 classroom program to move a certain number of inches straight ahead? We ran into that uh, two or three times this week that um, while the, um, Language, uh, the version of Scratch that we use with Spike Prime uh, does some of the calculations for you. If you tell it the circumference of the wheels by telling it uh, the distance associated with one rotation, it will, and then later tell it to move a certain distance, he'll do the math to figure out how many rotations or fractional rotations. For reasons that I can't explain, EV3 Classroom left that feature out, leaves it to the kids to do the math. So how would we write, do that? Um, in that version of Scratch. Well, how would we do it on paper? Uh, we know that the distance could be in inches or centimeters. Let's say it's in inches. Um, we know that 
uh, the wheels have a diameter. And if we're dealing in the uh, American or what do we call that, the imperial system, um, then the diameter of the wheels might be uh, in inches. And we might, may remember that we can calculate the circumference by multiplying the diameter by pi, uh, rounded off pi would be 3.14. Um, and so that's a calculation we can do on paper or we could teach the program how to do it. And then if we know the distance and we know the circumference, then the formula for the number of rotations that the wheel needs to make to go that distance is the distance divided by the circumference. And that could accidentally work out to a two or three, but more likely it's going to be 1.75 or, or some fractional amount. But if the, if the kids have the computer uh, do the calculation, uh, in some sense, they don't need to know the number of rotations as long as they do the calculation correctly. Uh, the computer will do it and uh, should do the number of rotations corresponding to the distance they wanted. So how would we do that in a program? Well, we'd create a variable. We'd actually probably create several variables. Um, and one of them could be pi. That's not actually a variable, it's more of a constant, but we can create a storage location called pi and put an approximation of pi into that storage location. Um, and the variables, because they're storage locations, you can read from them as in get their current value and you can write to them as in put in a new value. <coughs> You do the, the read by referring to the variable name in an oval. You drag that in uh, from the menu uh, onto the screen. You set uh, a, a variable location to a value by using the set feature. You ch can change it either by using the set feature and a formula or by using the change block where you can add a fixed amount, like take this current value, which might be seven, and add one and get eight. Um, that's a very common thing in programs, and I do have an example of that tonight. Um, so let's write that program. We'll uh, click on create a variable, and uh, well, actually, we're going to create a different one now. The guy that created the, these slides for me uh, didn't stick with the, the distance. Uh, we're going to talk about speed now. We're going to set the speed to uh, 50, as in 50%. Um, and then instead of a constant amount, we can use that variable. Um, if it's definitely gonna be 50, then why create a variable? But if we're going to have a standard speed that we reset the robot to seven places in the program, and then occasionally vary from that, um, then we might wanna create a variable with the standard speed and then use that variable all those seven places. And then a week later, if we decide our robot is tuned up and ready to go. We want the standard speed to be 70 instead of 50. We only have to change it one place. We changed where we set that speed variable and all the places we refer to it benefit from that change. That's uh, a small version of, of modularity due to a variable. Modularity is a fancy word for uh, localizing uh, decisions and making things easier to understand. Ah, here we go back to uh, what we were talking about before. Um, we set a variable called distance to 10. Why 10? Because we, somebody decided we wanted the robot to go 10 inches. Somebody measured the uh, particular wheel the robot's using and it was two and a quarter. So we set the variable called diameter to 2.25. Uh, pi is a universal constant in, in this universe and the approximation of it would be 3.14015 seven, um, and so we put that in a variable. Then we set the variable circumference to the product uh, obtained by multiplying diameter times pi. And then when we wanna go a particular distance, uh, we plug in the distance variable uh, and we divide by circumference. We don't absolutely have to have a distance variable uh, we could just keep that circumference around after that initial calculation. And if we want to go th three inches, we divide by, we say three divide by circum. If we want to go seven inches, we say uh, four, uh, seven divide by circum. So it's a, a bit of a stylistic question in some cases, whether you put everything in variables or just some things in variables. 
but you can definitely do the math with the variables. And in some cases you can do uh, equally well with, with constants plugged in in their place. Variables can also contain true uh, false uh, values. In this program, um, we use one to mean true. Um, in Scratch, you can also just set a variable to true. But in this case, we're going to um, set the variable stop loop to zero, meaning false at the top. Uh, let's see if my cursor will go up there, right there at the top when program starts. And then we have a loop that says keep repeating around and around until that stop loop variable changes to one. Um, and then we do various things in the loop, including like we did last night, we check to see if a button has been pressed connected to sensor A uh, and, oops, that's a bug. We can't have the same sensor, uh, both the pressure sensor, touch sensor and the color sensor connected to the same place. So. Let's say the color sensor is connected to D and we're comparing that to less than 20%. Um, in either case, we uh, say stop moving and then we stop the loop, which is uh, going around and around by set, setting the variable stop loop to one. And the next time it goes around, it says, oh, it's one now, I can stop. Um, to me, stylistically, it would have been cleaner to uh, have stop loop be true or false, but you can see it works either way. Um, if this was an actual program, I'd make that change right in front of your eyes and we could prove that the program works either by a numeric variable where we compare it to one or zero or um, a variable that is a true false can be plugged in more directly. Lists. I'm gonna show you lists, we're gonna have fun with lists, but your kids are probably not gonna use lists this season. It's there if they need them. So it'd be good uh, for you as a coach to know their existence in case you wanna ask them a question about, have you looked into the feature called lists? Maybe that could be helpful in this case. Uh, I would hesitate to tell them that the solution is lists because I can't think of a lot of examples where it would be, but I came up with an artificial one I'll show you in a minute. So you create a list, you can give it any name, and the author of this slide decided a fun name for this list was Blah. So we, uh, he uh, clicked on make a list and filled in the word Blah to be its name, and it magically created uh, six uh, scratch blocks for us. One that refers to the list as a whole, one that allows you to add something to the list uh, at the end of the list, one that allows you to delete something, from, uh, everything from the list, one that allows you to replace something in the list, one uh, uh, that allows you to set a particular item on the list to a particular value, and another to find out how long the list is. A pretty good analogy would be a shopping list. Uh, in the old days, it would be a piece of scratch paper and you could insert another piece of produce next to the bananas, or you could put the bananas at the bottom. Uh, so this, uh, these features allow you to decide where you wanna put something in a list or just add it at the end. Um, if you've got Alexa in your household, um, Alexa builds lists and then depending on whether you have an Alexa screen it might display that list for you, you can tell it to delete something from the list. So it does some of these things through oral communication, but in Scratch you do it with, with these programming blocks. Um, so here's an example of all of those different things. And I'm not gonna belabor all of them right now uh, because we got better things to do tonight. I'm gonna to just jump into an example. Here's a program that starts out with the standard stuff, set movement speed to something, you know, I pecked 50%. Uh, this is an EV3 robot. So a uh, good place for the motors to be plugged in is B and C. It would be atypical of Spike Prime, but legal. Um, and then I, I separately created a list called sequence and the, um, the program I, I created adds things. In the uh, first thing it adds to the sequence list is the digit one. Then it adds an R, then it adds a 1.5 and then it adds an L. Well, if we did 20 questions, some of you would guess the R stands for right and the L stands for left. 
And one's gonna stand for uh, one rotation. I'll give you a hint. And the 1.5 is one and a half rotations. So this is Bruce's way of saying he wants the robot to go one rotation forward, then turn sharp right, then one and a half rotations in the new forward, and then a sharp left. But these are not movement commands. The robot's not gonna do that if you just add those things to a list. So how do we get that done? Uh, well, we could do it the way we've been doing it all week, but here's a clever new way of doing it. We create a separate uh, code stack or block stack or scratch stack, uh, and it will execute when we push on the touch sensor that's mounted to, to my particular EVT robot connected to port one. Um, it then sets a, a separate variable, not a list, but a variable um, to call I for index to zero. Then it starts a repeat loop and the number of times it repeats is uh, the number of items currently in that list. Did somebody have a question? I'm talking way too fast. Shout out or put, I, I do have a, uh, a chat box. So I, I may catch the chat if you put it in chat or just shout it out if you have a question. Um, we're gonna get, we're gonna actually demonstrate this program in a few seconds. So things will get a little bit more interesting when we go live. Um, then I say, if, the item in the ith position of the sequence list is an L, turn left, or more specifically, use the move block to do a turn in place to the left for one half a rotation, which is about right for the size of wheels we're using on uh, the EB3. Not exactly, we'd, we'd need to adjust that um, to make it more precise, or even better, use the gyro to make a more precise turn. Uh, if it's not, if that uh, first thing on the list is not L, it might be R. So we say if the item uh, at location I in the list called sequence is an R, do a turn in place to the right for a half a rotation. So now I'm down here in this program. If it's not an L or an R, we're going to guess that it's a number because you saw the pattern uh, on the previous uh, slide. So we're gonna move straight for whatever that value is, uh, trusting that it's better be a number if it's not an L or an R. Um, so it does that for the first element, but then it goes back to the top of the loop. And if that list has four things in it, it's not done yet. It hasn't done it four times. Repeat four times is what this says, if the list has got four elements in it. So it increments I to two. And in the second position, it checks for L, checks for R. And if it's neither of those, it goes straight for that number of rotations. If it's L or R, these are turns left or right. Then it goes around for the third time, the fourth time. If there are 17 things in the list, it's gonna do 17 actions with this clever little loop. Would this be the way I program my robot? I'm not sure, but it's, it's fun. Um, and a somewhat realistic way of, of using lists in a robot program. So let's go back to the previous slide just for a glance, remind ourselves the robot's gonna run at 50% speed using movement motors connected to B and C. And then it, the first element of the list is gonna be a one. Second element's gonna be an R because we're adding to the end of the list in each case. Third element's gonna be 1.5 because we wanted to go one and a half rotations forward, the fourth element's gonna be L for left. The question from Chris is, so sequences are one base, not zero base. List in Scratch, yes, are start at one. Some programming languages are very nerdy and the first element of the list is zero, but in my limited experience with Scratch lists, the first element is one, uh, which is more intuitive for kids than most of us adults. Uh, computer people prefer zero. Keep those questions coming. So if this is our main program and this is the other program, it's not really a subroutine because we I haven't showed you my blocks yet. It's a separate uh, stack of blocks that will execute when we push on the touch sensor mounted on the robot. This is an event block at the top. So this program also lives 
in my EV3 app. So I'm going to drop to share, go find my EV3 app, say share that. And with a little bit of luck, those things are pretty much what I just showed you. Get a little bigger for you. So I screen captured those and put them on my slides after I wrote this program this afternoon. And so we're going to download it into the robot. And I forgot to power up the EV3. So that's going to take about 30 seconds. So I'll jabber a little bit more. Or I'll take another question while it's powering up. Um, so again, when the program starts, it's going to set the speed and the uh, port for the motors. And it's going to fill the list with four values. And then when I push the touch sensor, it's going to go around this loop. We know it's four, but the program doesn't know that until it gets uh, uh, the length of the list um, from that list in the sequence. Uh, Melody says, so I'm thinking of how to apply this. So we could say when a sensor is pressed, just so then we would activate a separate stack to return the EV3 back to the corner. Ah, that, that could be it. Um, especially if you know uh, pretty exactly where the, uh, the robot's going to be. Um, perhaps the robot used a sensor to detect that it was in the corner or up against a wall. Uh, yeah, then it, then it, it might do that. Um, another way of doing it might be to create a my block that processes the list. And whenever you want the list to be processed, you call the my block, but we haven't covered my blocks yet. So that would be getting ahead of ourselves. Um, Chris has two questions. Can a list element be removed? Yeah, one of the things, let's go to that. Um, if we go to variables, um, sequence, it created some blocks for us. Uh, we, can, we can delete everything uh, in the list. We can replace, uh, that's interesting. I don't see it, oh, there it is, no. No, I don't see one for removing. I thought it was there. Wonder if that's hidden somewhere in the language. I would have thought they would have. Wait, one. I'm confused, Bruce. So when yeah. I look over here, I see sequence, add this, delete all of sequence is the third one down. Right. You can clean out the list. Uh, okay. Uh, with the big fat eraser. But right. uh, can you say Just... you don't no longer want bananas on your shopping list because right. Somebody brought home bananas from the produce stand. Um, okay. Seems like that ought to be there, but I don't see it. Ah, okay, okay. So instead, you would need to replace it with something else, I guess. Or maybe it's a hidden feature that I'm just not seeing. Um, all right, it's booted. So now I need to connect to Bluetooth. Um, it's searching. I say connect. And it's connected. Now I say download this program. Uh, you may not have heard the turtle, but I did. Uh, and now I need to switch cameras. And I'm going to stop the share to make it bigger on some of your screens. Uh, I'm going to move my chat boxes on top of my camera control. There we go. So. When I start this program, first I need to make sure I've got the right program ready. Yep. It's going to appear to do nothing. Because what it did was set the speed, uh, set the ports, and fill the list. But it hasn't actually told the robot to do anything yet. But now I'm going to reach down. You should be able to see it on the webcam. Uh, I'm going to push that red button and escort the the separate stack of blocks is going to go through my list. So it did those four things. So let me go back to the screen share of the program. And if I go to the add thing uh, here and fill in, I'm going to just be bold and say minus 1.5 and see if that works. 
no, minus two. See if it'll back up if I give it two. And then I'm going to add another one to the list and say R. So when it executes this, when I restart the program, the list is gonna have six things in it instead of four. So when I push the button, this repeat loop will now know that it's a length of six and it'll go around six times. And if we get lucky, minus two means uh, when it does it right here, uh, move straight for minus two rotations. I think that'll cause it to go backwards. We'll see. Stop share. Oh, I need to download. I, anytime you see me forget to do that, shout out. Got to download it. I did it. Okay. Let's stop the share. Check to see if I'm on the right program. Yep, still the right program. And once again, it, it doesn't do anything. In, uh, the robot doesn't move, but the program should have filled that list with six things. So I reach down and push this. It backed up, and then it turned right. It did six things instead of four. At the very least, that's amusing. And who knows, this may be a powerful new robot uh, programming feature that all the kids will fall in love with if you show it to them. Or they will declare it useless because of the other ways we're, we're learning the program. So I'm going to test your patience and go back to the slides for a while. So when you get the PDFs, you've got some homework you can do. And then um, we're gonna talk about my blocks, which is, as you heard earlier, one of my favorites. Why well, do you care about um, a my block, which is a technique for creating a new block from a sequence of other blocks? Um, well, if you have a complex program um, that uses, uh, say, a sequence of three or four blocks in six different places, and you discover that it's not working, that sequence is not quite right, you're gonna to have to find all six places and make sure you apply the improvement to six places. If instead that sequence of blocks was put into a separate place, defining a new block called sequence, or no, I already used that tonight, uh, let's call it favorite. Favorite sequence of blocks, we have a, a new a block called favorite, Anytime we wanna do our favorite sequence, we insert a block called favorite, as we'll see. If we wanna make improvement to that sequence, we change it in one place and all the places that we use the favorite block uh, get the new improvement, whether it's more efficient, faster, more reliable, uh, we get that improvement. Um, another advantage is both mental and visual. Um, so let me talk about the visual first. Uh, last night, you noticed I was struggling as I added more blocks to the program. I had to kind of drag it up and down. I could have zoomed out, but then it would have been harder for you to see it. But uh, the kids sitting right in front of the computer screen can zoom out and they can get more blocks crowded on the screen. But you gradually run out of screen real estate if the program getting, gets complicated. But if you create a my block that represents certain common sequences, they can be stashed off to the right or left, and the main program can be uh, fit more easily on the screen, and the human brain can understand it more quickly. Um, I think some of you have heard the rule of seven. Uh, that might be a rule for teenagers and maybe uh, people younger than me. Um, I think my, my number is about five now, and, and probably fourth graders are about at five or six, things they can keep in their mind at once. But if you create a my block and use it a couple of times along with some other blocks, maybe the main program is still five blocks long, but is the equivalent of 20 or 30 blocks long because the my block is representing a different sequence. But this is pretty cosmic. Let's get into the reality and see if any of that uh, matches what I just said. 
What if you wanted to go forward to stop on a black line and then turn a particular direction? You could create a mind block that did that and you could use it every place in, uh, in, in every mission that the kids created for First Lego League where they needed to go uh, and stop on, on a, a black line. I think if you look at this year's mission map, it's similar to last year's in the sense that it has a lot of black lines on it. So this could be a real example. Uh, let's get away from using a sensor for a few minutes and talk about what if you had a good reason to drive a robot in a square. Um, and you could, you could say, go straight for 10 centimeters, um, turn right, go straight for 10 meters, 10 centimeters, turn right, go straight for 10 centimeters, turn right, go straight for 10 meters, turn right. And those eight blocks would do something sort of like a square. Uh, but if you discovered that uh, 0.5 is not a very close approximation of the right turn, it's really 0.46, you would have to change it in four places. If you decided that you didn't want the square really to be 10 centimeters, you wanted it to be 11.5 centimeters, on each side, you'd have to change that in four places. So how might a my block help us? We could go to the my blocks menu, which is off on the left. We'll, get, we'll see that live in a, a few minutes. And you, you say, make a block. It then gives you a block and, and gives you a hint that you, you need to give it a name. Uh, as you get more advanced, you can also add things called in inputs and labels, but we'll get to that later. Uh, let's create a mind block called move and turn. We did that by clicking on make a block and then filled in move and turn as its name. But that doesn't do, make it do something and we have to fill it in. But first we have to save, save it so that it puts it on the screen for us. After it's saved, it magically appears uh, in the menu as something that will execute um, if we put it in a program. Um, but we also get a defined block on the, on the screen that we can now plug things into. And we can put anything we want here. And anytime the move and turn block is used in a program, it will do those things. So let's do two, th let's plug in two things. Let's pu uh, put in a move straight for 10 centimeters and a move right, a uh, hundred means turn in place for half a rotation. I guess it's a spike prime because uh, EV3 doesn't have centimeters in its move feature. Um, so we've now got a move and turn block and um, we can create a stack of blocks that initializes to uh, set the movement motors to A and B and the speed to 50%. And we've got this my block, but we haven't actually used it yet. To use it, we add move and turn from the my blocks menu by dragging it and plugging it in. But if we want to make a square, we need four of them. So we add it four times. Or we could create a loop and say repeat four and then just use it once. But for quick simplicity, we'll just plug it in four times. And that's the equivalent of these two blocks four times. Um, and we're, we're going to go demonstrate a, a different example in a minute. But uh, let me go back and say, if we later decide it should be 0.46 for a right turn, um, or we want the uh, square to be built uh, counterclockwise by with left turns, we can change it in one place. If we want the uh, side of the square to, uh, to be different than 10, we change it in one place, and all four of these will benefit from that change. What if we want a block that moves in a particular uh, distance and we want to decide the distance later? Uh, we can create a new block. In this case, we'll call it go straight. And we'll, we can add an input um, by dragging this add an input onto the, there or clicking on it. It adds it next. If we uh, we then fill in a name for that input, which is distance. We could have called it X or I or J or uh, CM for centimeters. Um, if we want to remind ourselves and anybody else on our team what gets filled in there, we can use uh, a label. Um, 
so we, we click on text and fill in a label here. This doesn't affect what the program does. It affects what the human sees on the screen, centimeters and turn right. So now we have a block that actually um, it has expanded itself from go straight to go a certain, go straight a certain distance. And then it claims to do that in centimeters and then turn right. But it doesn't actually do that yet. We've got to finish it. So we add blocks to it. We, have, we put in a move straight like we did before, but instead of a fixed number of centimeters, we drag this uh, distance input down to here. And that tells us to use whatever we decide later. And then we add another block that uh, makes the right turn. So now its name is descriptive. It goes straight for a certain, dis on a certain number of centimeters and turn right. Um, then in our main program, we can say go straight 10 and turn right, go straight 10 four times, and we'll get the same effect as we did before. So why did we get all that trouble? What if we didn't want a square? We wanted a, a 10 by five rectangle. We could change, leave this as 10, change the second one to five, leave the third one as 10, and change the fourth one to five, and we would be telling it to go straight for 10 and turn right, go straight for five and turn right, go straight for 10 and go turn right, and go straight for five and turn right, and that ought to be a 10 by five rectangle. Is this something exactly that the kids would want to do in, in uh, First Lego League? I doubt it, but you can imagine that's something more complex having to do with what's going on in the playing field might uh, belong in a my block. And I gave you an example earlier where it might go use a sensor to go out and find a black line and then do something when it finds the black line. Uh, another thought here is this right turn, we might, I already said we could refine it by changing the number of rotations. We could also refine it by using the gyro here, improving this my block and all these turns including anywhere else we use this my block in the program would benefit from our new gyro improved my block. Ah, here I actually did it. I forgot I created a slide for that. Uh, I just, uh, without actually doing it live, it, on the slide, I've replaced the turn um, with a, uh, gyro control turn. But I think there's a, uh, oh, it does do the move straight first. It sets the angle to zero, does the move straight, then it starts to move uh, a right turn in place, and then waits for the yaw angle to get greater than 99 and then stops moving. So this is the equivalent, but hopefully more precise version of the program on slide 95. Slide 96 shows the improve my block. <coughs> Now let me melt your mind before we get realistic with a real program. My blocks can call other my blocks. So in this complex uh, web of my blocks, um, we've got one that set, sets the movement speed um, and circumference uh, in a my block on the lower left. And that's used twice in the main program. So this on the lower left is used here and here in the main program. And then a my block called uh, drive in a particular length centimeter square is used uh, twice in the main program, once it to go make it 10 centimeter square and once a five centimeter square, excuse me. That my block does four things. Um, to create a square, and that four things is the my block that was on the previous screen that uses the gyro to make a precise right turn. So this becomes a workhorse used four times in this my block. This my block creates a square of a particular size, and that's used twice: once for ten centimeters, and once for five. If you're uh, if smoke is not coming out of your ears yet, uh, you're not paying attention. That that's pretty fast, pretty complicated but you can see it's pretty powerful if the kids work up to this over time, they can do some pretty nice things using my blocks. Can you imagine how complicated this program would be if we 
uh, had to repeat this sequence, this gyro sequence, eight times to make four squares. Excuse me, to make two squares. Um, that would be a pretty long program, and we'd have to intermingle the go straights as well. Um, so this is a much simpler program and easier to understand once you get the idea that each my block has a function and it can use other my blocks to accomplish it. So in summary, my blocks have names that you can give them data, uh, sometimes referred to as inputs and sometimes as parameters. The inputs or parameters can be numbers, they can be text, uh, they can be yes, no values as in two faults, Boolean values. Uh, you can also add labels, not for the computer to execute, but for the human eye to see to remind you uh, what that mind block does. Uh, you can use them anywhere in the program, uh, just like a, a built-in block. And at the risk of uh, complexity, one mind block can call or use another mind block. So um, I'm going to demonstrate all of this in a few seconds, but the homework assignment is to use my blocks instead of doing squares to uh, create a particular triangle. And the second homework assignment is to create a trapezoid uh, with the uh, sides of the trapezoid being 30, 30, 50, 30, 30, and 50. Uh, so it's a, a, a six-sided trapezoid and the angles uh, should add up correctly to make a full circle by um, 90, 45, 45, 90, 45, and 45. So that's your homework assignment if you have the time. Let's leave this and go to Spike Prime. Mm -hmm. Spike Prime is hiding on my screen. Oh, here he is. So I'm going to create a new project using WordBox. Create. Uh, I need to turn on that robot. Uh, Chris asked if a my block can call itself. I believe so, but you would have to have uh, a way that it would know when to go back to itself and then go back. Uh, uh, otherwise, you would get infinite recursion. Um, but don't trust my answer. It, it may be that maybe Scratch uh, doesn't like recursion. That's interesting. These blocks do not look familiar. I think I clicked on the wrong thing. Let's say new project. I think those are the new icon blocks. I let, let it be icon blocks and I, I need to study up on icon blocks. So I'm gonna click word blocks and then create and it's gonna look much more familiar. Um, somebody else asked whether my blocks is like creating a template in Word. Yes, it is definitely analogous, analogous to a template. Good, good thought. Um, so let me make this a little bigger. And I'm going to go to the movement blocks. And I'm going to do my traditional set the speed. If I connect. Um, It'll figure out where my motors are for me. So it figured it out that they're at C and D for me. Like otherwise I could have filled that in C and D. And it guessed correctly that my wheels are 17 and a half centimeters. Now I want to go straight. And then I want to turn right.
Uh, let me, I'll change mine, I'll, I'll turn left. Nine centimeters. And then I'm gonna go straight again. And then I wanna turn right. Oh, sorry. I wanna use the distance versions. Okay, so this is going to do a zigzag. It's going to go straight for 10 centimeters. It's going to make a turn in place to the left. It's going to go straight for 10 centimeters and turn placed to the right. And let's have it go straight one more time, this time for five centimeters. So we haven't used my blocks, but I'll get, I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, this is a simple version of what we did on Monday evening. I need to download this. I'll go ahead and put it in slot zero. And we'll stop to share. And select program zero and tell it to go. So it did the, the four sequences. Hey, I guess if I was true to my new technique, I would have done that with a list, right? Uh, but I, I did it with traditional programming uh, because I'm a traditional guy. So I'm going to go back to Spike Prime. And I'm going to create a my block. If you go down to my blocks, it's red, or I could scroll down to it. But if I click Bruce, on, the... I'm sorry to bother you. Can, can you please. run that one more that sequence one more time, please? Sure. I was checking my notes while you ran, and I wanted to see it. Okay, so Thank you, you see on the screen, uh, straight ten, turn left, straight ten, turn right, straight five. So we'll stop to share, and. So I think it followed instructions. Thank you. You're welcome. So back to screen share. I'm going to click on my blocks. And I need to say my, make a block. And remember on the slide, it said it, it created something for us to fill in the block name. I'm going to call it right. Um, and for now, I want, I'm not going to have a parameter. And I'm going to save that. And it's put it in the menu so we can use it later. But it's also give us a hint that we need to define it. So we need to plug something into that. Well, what we could plug into it is this. Will the program do the same thing? No, because I didn't, I took the right out, but if I put it back as a my block, the program should do what it did before. I haven't really accomplished anything yet. I, hopefully I'm leading up to something a little bit more powerful than replacing one block with one block. But just to show you that nothing's changed other than cosmetic or format, I'll download it and run it again. Okay. Now I'm going to set this 
aside and I'm going to go to the movement blocks and get a start moving. And I'm going to say turn in place to the right. And then I'm going to get a weight from the control menu. And then I'm going to go to sensors and get the one that looks like it's the pitch angle, but it's actually, we can change it to the yaw angle. And then I'm going to get an operator. Um, and I'm going to use the greater than and change it to greater than 89. So the weight will wait, the program will wait while the robot is turning. The program will wait until the yaw angle is greater than 89, which is, let's say, 90. And then it needs to stop doing what it was doing. So the robot needs to stop. So we need to insert a stop. So I'm going to claim that unless I've got a bug, this will do what this simpler block did, but it should do it more reliably because it's not approximating a right turn with nine centimeters. It's using a sensor so that it should get uh, should get to 90 precisely. So let me download that. And one more time, the program should do the same thing, but subtly, but importantly, for getting points in first Lego leg, it should do it more reliably. Interesting. I've got a bug. I caught myself last night and fixed the bug, but tonight I didn't catch myself. So let's go back. It's looking for a yaw angle greater than 90 relative to what? It's relative to where the robot started um, rather than just before it made the right turn, because we didn't set the yaw angle to zero just before the turn. Remember, I did that last night, but I forgot it this tonight. Anne is asking if we're going to do a sound. Yeah, I'll toss on a sound uh, right now rather than waiting until the slides because we won't get there tonight. Um, so I need to go back to sensors and get the very special blocks at yaw angle to zero, put it there. So that zero is relative to where it starts to turn rather than when the robot uh, started, well, started a, its overall motion. And by popular request, we're going to add a sound. And this is very cute the first time you hear it, and then it gets obnoxious real quick. But Thank we'll you, Bruce. Only do it once. I speak from experience because I wrote a program that meowed over and over again. I drove myself crazy. And I'm not sure how well the meow will come out on your end uh, over Zoom, but you can tell me. That's downloaded. Okay, so I, I'm not real happy with that right turn, but it didn't it didn't uh, go crazy. I didn't hear the meow though. Did anybody hear a meow? I did not. Okay, so let's go back, and look at the program. I'm going to take it out of the my block. Uh, 
I'm going to use this play meow instead of start meow. I'm not an expert on sound. So let's put that right at the beginning of the program and right at the end of the program. And then while we're at it, I'm going to add another right turn. I'm going to go back to the My Blocks menu, grab another copy of right, and stick it after it goes five centimeters. So it'll go 10, turn left, forward 10, turn right, forward five, turn right, and then end with a meow. Stop share. Hmm. Well, it did the right motions. Still don't know where the meow went, though. Um, let's go back, play some more. The meow comes out of the computer speaker. That might be a problem with Zoom. So I'm going to change it. to beeping instead of meowing. And I'm gonna put another movement in. Are you right clicking on the block to delete it, Bruce? Oh yeah, I did a shortcut. I should have explained my actions. Yeah, you you can grab the block if you grab it carefully and toss it off to the left. But sometimes if you're trying to get rid of something, it's easier to right click it and then select delete. Um, okay, thank you. Doesn't work so well on a Mac unless you have a, a two button uh, mouse connected to your Mac. Um, I'm not a Mac expert, but that's, I'm told that you you can get a right click on a Mac if you try hard enough. Um, all right, so I'm going to do another straight, another five, and another right. And another sound. For a half a second. Okay, since we're going to run out of time, I'm going to give you kind of a punchline on where we're going here. We've got one that handles right turns, but we don't have one to replace the left turn. So we have two ways we could go if we had another half an hour. Um, we could write one that's very similar to this one, but it makes left turns. It's a little bit uh, more complicated because counterclockwise. Uh, would run it negative, and so we'd have to check for less than minus 89, which I think we did once last night to go left turn. So we could have two my blocks, one for right turns and one for left turns. Or we could create a my block called turn, and we could pass it an input, the letter R or the letter L, and have it do an if then else. When it sees the R, it does one thing. When it sees the L, it does the other. Um, so you can have to use your imagination because we're going to be out of time in a few seconds. But my blocks are very powerful and, and can do lots of fun things with them. So I just downloaded the one that now has three right turns and beeps at the beginning and beeps at the end. I'm hoping that we actually get some sound out of this robot this time. It did beep, but I'll have to hold it up to this microphone for you to hear it. I have a separate mic. It wants to turn and I'm not letting it.
Did you hear the beep finally at the end there? It's 8.02. Um, Thank you so much, Bruce. You're welcome. Well, we'll do two rounds of questions. Um, but yes, feel free to Bruce. wait. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask anybody that wants to ask a question, and then I'm going to stop this, uh, the uh, recording and ask for questions again. But everybody's welcome to call it a night. Thank you for your perseverance and diligence. Watch for email tomorrow and uh, send me your questions.